Europe doesn't have enough workers, but right-wing parties want to curb migration. An easy way to fill the gap. So what does the rise of the far right mean for jobs? And what impact is it having on the economy? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. In Italy, Finland and Greece, the far right is gaining a foothold and one sector in particular is warning it will be seriously harmed by anti-immigration policies. Tech companies struggle to recruit enough skilled workers and further bans could jeopardise their business. So can these governments keep everyone happy? Over a period of decades, ASML has quietly become a world leader in the semiconductor business. We are really at the helm of the value-added chain that, over the past 50 years, has been able to develop electronic products and applications that are used in everyday life, whether to drive the car, cook a restaurant, call your friends, or even just to use your fridge. ASML is the Netherlands' biggest company, valued at over $300 billion and employing 23,000 people in its home base. 40% of them come from abroad, as do more than half the staff at NXP Semiconductors, another huge Dutch tech firm. And this is becoming an issue. We will make sure the Netherlands will be for the Dutch people again. We will restrict the tsunami of asylum and migration. With the country's shift to the right in November following Geert Wilder's electoral success, corporate leaders have warned they may be forced to relocate elsewhere if anti-immigration rhetoric turns into government policy and leaves them unable to recruit skilled foreign labour. The outgoing Dutch government has responded by committing $2.7 billion to building transport infrastructure in the region where ASML is based, as well as expanding technical education and building more homes. The goal is to connect high-tech campuses and make the area more attractive for highly educated workers. But as big as it is, ASML is one corporation in one region. What of the many others across Europe that say they also risk losing their competitive edge if they struggle to bring in foreign tech workers with more anti-immigration policies on the cards? Well, let's meet our guests. In London, we have Lorenzo Codogno, visiting professor in practice at the European Institute at LSE, and he is formerly chief economist at the Italian Treasury. In Lancaster, in the UK, is Hilary Ingham. She's professor of economics at Lancaster University. And Ulrich Bruckner is professor for European studies at Stanford University in Berlin. You're all very welcome to Roundtable. Hilary, I'll come to you first. As much as some politicians rail against migration, it's very much needed for the economy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, if you look at Europe, I mean, most countries have actually got ageing populations. So what you actually have is an increasing number of people who are retired, who are effectively reliant on younger people to actually support them. And of course, as the balance between young people and older people changes, then we rely on new younger workers coming into the country to, to actually provide money to keep the older population. And you can see in sectors you know, like the, the NHS, where you've got lots of overseas workers coming to be nurses, doctors, that we are very, very dependent on them. And another sector which hasn't been so prevalent before but now uh, the UK is recruiting teachers from overseas because we can't get the supply of teachers we need in the UK. Lorenzo, in your home country of Italy, migration is always a huge talking point. But the facts of the matter are Italy needs migrant workers, doesn't it? Well, Italy needs uh, migrants um, as well as other European countries. Um, as it was mentioned, there is a demographic... Uh, uh, issue that is uh, that looms uh, large uh, in the future, and uh, and there is already a quite a dramatic uh, uh, collapse uh, in uh, uh, net balance between uh, newborn uh, babies and death. 
And so the natural rate, so-called natural rate, uh, is uh, in deeply negative territory in Italy as well as in other countries. So there is no other solution but to attract uh, immigrants. The problem is, of course, uh, what kind of immigrants you can attract. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the ideal solution would be for many countries to have a skilled labor, uh, basically people um, coming from abroad and ready to jump into the production process and help the economy. So Lorenzo, is it fair to say that, you know, Italy would love to see more skilled migrants coming in and less people on boats? Is, is that what reading between the lines we're getting? I would say yes, although in Italy there is no such a debate as in Germany, for instance. Germany was quite explicit. The German government decided to open up uh, uh, for, to immigration of skilled labor, actually especially engineers, because today's uh, factories are no longer in need of blue-collar workers. They need the skilled engineers. So Germany is trying explicitly to attract uh, uh, skilled engineers from outside of Europe and from Europe as well. Uh, in Italy, this debate is still in its infancy, I would say, uh, but the need is probably equally, uh, equally important. Ulrich, you're in Germany. Just give us your impression of the migrant debate across your country. Well, we have to distinguish between asylum policy and our humanitarian commitment to help people in need, which is given the history of my country, something that goes back to the situation of the beginning of West Germany, when the new government was reminded that people who had to flee in Nazi Germany got a helping hand with asylum in other countries. So we are obliged to do the same for people in need. So that's why we had a pretty liberal asylum regulation from the start. And that is very important and deeply rooted in the country. On the other hand, we have never seen a higher employment rate in Germany than in the last few years. And as has been said already, Germany is actively recruiting the best brains around the world. And this is not only about engineers. This is also about the health system, and we have labor market shortages in low-paid work, like in restaurants and in the tourism industry. So across the board, there is a demand for work. And that's something very different from supporting people who are traumatized or flee from war zones and who certainly don't meet the requirements of a sophisticated labor market. And your former leader, Chancellor Angela Merkel, she was adamant. She wanted to open the doors, welcome people in and use these migrants for Germany's economic benefit. I think this is a misinterpretation of the situation in 2015-16. That was a very human decision on the spot that if there are people who are already in Europe, we can't send them back and we have to give them a helping hand because Germany is a big country, it's rich and it can live up to its commitment to help people in need. This is independent from the labor market situation as if she would plan to make refugees from war zones, IT technicians, that can happen in two generations or three, but not something that instantly helps to fill the labor market shortages. So she didn't really open the borders because within the European Union, we don't have borders, but we have to create something like an integrated migration policy in which we address all the different elements like border control and integration and resettlement and burden sharing and, and, and. So it's not just you press one button and then the problem is fixed. Hillary, we're seeing more and more right-wing and far-right parties gain traction in countries as diverse as Hungary, Slovakia, Portugal, uh, Germany, for example, with the AFD. Even across the United Kingdom, we're seeing more and more right-wing policies. What's your impression of how right-wing politicians run economies? Well, I mean, you are quite right. I mean, obviously, you know, Victor Orban, you go back to 1998 when he was first elected and he's been re-elected several times since. 
I mean, in terms of the, the way, you know, they, they run economies, they tend to be anti-liberal. Um, you know, in Poland, there was um, an attempt to restrict the power of the judiciary, which is quite odd when you think of the sort of history of Poland and how it was dominated by the old Soviet Union. So they, they tend to pursue sort of quite anti-liberal, quite restrictive policies. Um, I can't think of any sort of examples where they've been highly successful in running modern market economies. But of course, you've not got um, a long history of, of anything to sort of really look at. Um, but it, it certainly is the case that, that this is the way it's going. And I mean, it's not just within national governments, it's in regional governments as well. And although you might think that the UK is somewhat different, then of course, the Reform UK, although it doesn't have um, any elected MPs, only somebody that's actually moved across. They do reckon that if, you know, Nigel Farage came back, who was the, the big push behind Brexit, then, then they might stand a chance of actually winning a number of seats. And of course, it looks like we'll be having a general election possibly in the summer or if not November. Um, so we would have to see, you know, what, what sort of power they have. Um, but, you know, I don't think the evidence is there one way or the other yet. Lorenzo, in Italy, when Giorgia Maloney first came in, she was, in her rhetoric, strongly anti-migrant. Everyone across Europe feared a right-wing government in Italy. But she's really kind of dialed back on those words, hasn't she, since she's assumed power. And she seems to be a very stable politician with conservative policies at the heart of what she's doing in Italy. Well, she is certainly coming from the far right, but uh, obviously, uh, if you want to stay in power, you need to move to the center. And uh, this is what is happening. So effectively, Meloni has become much more pragmatic than the uh, when she was in a position. And now she's trying to actually get uh, the European support uh, for the immigration issue. So I think uh, it is also... Uh, a situation which is a bit uh, uh, ambiguous in a sense, because on the one hand, uh, clearly uh, uh, the Canon government is restricting on uh, illegal immigrants, uh, trying to cut the links um, with NGOs uh, and uh, and the support uh, that uh, some immigrants are getting in crossing the Mediterranean Sea. On the other hand, however, there is a very strong pressure from businesses and uh, and industry. Uh, to get uh, qualified people on board. And, uh, and oddly enough, uh, this government has sharply increased the number of legal immigrants that Italy is taking every year. Ulrich, what can you see the European Union doing in the next few years with regard to migration? I mean, Europe's economy needs migrants, needs skilled young workers moving frictionlessly across borders. It, it's a huge talking point, isn't it? It's a big, big issue for the EU. It is a very big issue, but the European Union is a, con a conglomerate of sovereign states that define their own migration policy and they bring it to the European Union because the European Union's competence is quite limited to something that goes to the heart of a democracy. Because if the European Union would define what is the demos and what it consists of, especially the small countries, would fear that this is the end of the titular nation and they can't really control how to organize their own country and it will have far-reaching cultural problems. This is certainly not an issue for Germany with our 84 million people, but for small countries and countries on the edge, it is a matter of survival, culturally speaking. So it is a very hot potato and very controversial, but the European Union urgently needs to do what it can do best, which is to provide a legal framework, to reform an asylum policy, to organize well-protected borders, and to establish a mechanism of solidarity in which those countries who, who for whatever reason, don't want to take enough refugees should support, uh, support those who are willing and able to give a helping hand for people in need. And on the other hand, addressing all the labor market questions that we started with, 
because it's not just Italy or Germany that face demographic problems. It's across the board, a problem of an aging European Union in something like a very fast changing geopolitical environment. And retirement homes are usually not the most innovative ones. Lorenzo, I'll just come to you on that point. Italy's population is aging. You've already mentioned that the birth rate in Italy is falling to a worrying level. I mean, there needs to be a real understanding that migration is a way out of this, a solution to the problem. Yes, absolutely. It is not the only solution because clearly there is also a need to increase support for uh, women that uh, become pregnant and, uh, and uh, help in uh, raising kids. Uh, that is the other side of the coin. And, uh, and the government is trying to, to go in that direction as well. Uh, but uh, at least in the short term, there won't be any alternative but uh, to try to increase qualified uh, immigration from abroad uh, to support the labor market and also to, to maintain uh, um, uh, public finances in order, because clearly with the demographic collapse, uh, also public finances would actually suffer. Hilary, in the UK, a statistic I saw recently that quite shocked me, really, Office for National Statistics, they say 21.8% of the UK population, that's 9.2 million people, aged 16 to 64, are not in work and are not looking for a job. So one in five of the adult population in the UK, economically inactive. I mean, that stat in itself is very surprising, isn't it? Yeah, this is a, a figure, I mean, it's known as the sort of the great resignation. And at, at first it was thought it was a sort of um, side effect of what happened after the pandemic in that, you know, some people had felt they were happier at home. They'd got the finances um, to retire and that's what they did. But when you start looking at the statistics uh, in more detail, it's rather more complicated because if you actually look as to why those people are economically inactive, you find that the major driver behind it is actually health reasons. And that splits into to two types. So you've got people with physical health issues, some of which are sort of, you know, life limiting. So it, it means that they may not be able to do their normal job. So for example, if you've got a manual job, but you're waiting for a hip replacement, then you may not be able to work. And of course, you know, the NHS has got record waiting lists, um, operations are cancelled. And don't forget, in the UK, we've still got these junior doctor strikes that, that keep causing us big problems in terms of getting these waiting lists down. But then on the other side, you've got a, a lot of um, people with mental health issues. And again, the provision for those people is, is not good. And it was sort of thought at one time, you know, when the cost of living crisis came along, then people would feel the need to go back to work because they, they couldn't afford not to. Um, but the, the great return to work didn't happen. And that is because a lot of the inactivity is driven by, you know, people with health problems. And so really, until you sort the, the NHS out, this problem could well persist. And again, you know, the doctor's strike, which is making things a lot worse. Ulrich, are you shocked to see figures like that from Britain, that one in five adults in the UK are not in work and they're not looking for work? I mean, what kind of figures would you see in Germany, say? Well, the situation is quite different here. Not only when you walk around and you see all these energetic, like 60 is the new 40 type of retirees or people who have new plans what to do with this last phase of their lives. We have a record high life expectancy and people stay healthier longer. We see a decline in the consumption of alcohol. People eat and drink healthier. And we have a better health system that is taking care of people, which leads to a situation that not only more people live in Germany than ever before, but we have a record high employment rate and still shortages in the labor market. So this is probably the reason why the, the government is reaching out even to places like Vietnam to recruit new workforce because there's simply not enough coming from Germany and there's a higher demand for it.
So on the one hand, Germany becomes more diverse and multicultural, but on the other hand, that's easy to instrumentalize for populists who play with people's fears that someone who hasn't met any foreigner is potentially afraid that he loses status or Germany turns into another country. Lorenzo, is it similar in Italy that you have large numbers of people not in work, not looking for work? I know the Italian population is getting older, but what are you seeing? What trends are there in Italy? Well, clearly, Italy has a much higher unemployment rate than Germany, for instance, uh, but the situation is improving. Uh, certainly from COVID onwards, uh, we haven't really seen uh, the so-called great resignation or re re reduction in the uh, supply of, uh, of labor. Uh, indeed, there has been a sharp increase in uh, activity rate, which is positive in my view, very positive. And, um, and so uh, Italy is really catching up. Uh, now, having said that, uh, uh, youth unemployment, especially in the South, is still pretty high. And uh, uh, women uh, not, uh, not active in the labor market is still a higher percentage than in many other countries. But again, uh, uh, the good news is that uh, it's, a, it's a cohort effect. The good news is uh, that uh, more women are entering the labor market um, at a fast pace. It is a phenomenon that started many years ago and is continuing. And therefore, overall activity rate is actually increasing. Hillary, big election coming in the UK, quite likely to see a change of government with Labour coming in at some point, if the polls are to be believed. Do you think migration will be one of the big talking points and campaigning issues in the UK this year? I think there's no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, you know, even if you think back to the sort of um, Brexit referendum, I mean, the, the big selling point to Brexit was we could take back control and we would control our borders and, you know, we wouldn't be witnessing such high levels of immigration. Well, that clearly didn't happen. Uh, so I think when we come to this uh, election, I think immigration will be very high on the agenda. From what I've seen, I don't think any party's got a particular answer to it um, because it really all depends on, on, on what we're looking at. I mean, we're obviously not like uh, the... the the EU because we've left the EU so we don't have this free movement we still do need uh, all sorts of different types of workers we need skilled workers semi-skilled workers you know a, a sector like social care has got a chronic undersupply of labor and you know the UK government does have a sort of complicated schedule of what you need to earn and what sponsorship you need to actually come and work in the UK and they, they've now um, increased the, the figure you need to earn £38,000 a year, which, of course, for a lot of the low wage occupations that where we have shortages, that that isn't going to be met. But I think that the problem that people really face in the UK or what people are really concerned about, they, they're quite happy if we've got migrants from the EU or Australia or New Zealand. I think what, what they are afraid of of people who are not like them. So I think what they're really concerned about is the refugees coming over in the boats from France, um, you know, a lot of who are coming from war-torn countries. Um, and I think there's the, the sort of the, the problem of, of how you distinguish those that are just economic migrants coming here because they think they can get more money and those that are coming because they really are not safe. So it's a very difficult problem. Ulrich, as the surge of migration continues in the years and decades to come across Europe, do you think parties like the AFD, uh, Alternative for Deutschland, right-wing party in your country, do you think they will tap into that anti-migrant or perceived anti-migrant sentiment in Germany? Well, as a communication strategy, they certainly do, and they see that it works. If we look at countries like the Netherlands with Wilders, or how Meloni came into power, and this is independent from the situation on the ground, because Italy is a country of 60 million people, and they made a big fuss about 60,000 migrants coming to Italy, even those people who do not want to stay in Italy and rather want to go further north. 
And this was called like a flood and a cultural challenge to the country. So this is how they make politics, but not something that actually addresses facts and addresses the situation in the in the labor market. So yes, we will see campaigns like this in the upcoming European parliamentary elections and in regional elections, like in countries like Saxony, where it's most likely that they will be the strongest party, but whether they find a coalition partner remains to be seen. Ulrich, Hillary and Lorenzo, thank you all for your input and insight. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the Roundtable team, thank you for watching and goodbye.